So let's recap part one. Alistair Darling, I'm on the level. We reviewed his speech to the IMF in October 2007 and his Guardian interview in August 2008, both of which suggest strongly that he had no concept what was going to happen in late 2008 until, at the earliest, summer 2007. Even then, he considered what is a fairly regular occurrence of an economic cycle hitting a recession, not a global meltdown. Yet we then saw clearly that leading members of our government and Mervyn King of the Bank of England attended a Bilderberg conference in May 2003, where the attendees were told, it was no suggestion but a statement of fact, that the West was going to economically collapse and that the attendees should reorientate their own investment portfolios to suit. That is absolute knowledge, a full five years prior. And it is insider trading, a crime, at the highest levels of government and banking. If you knew a terrorist who told you he was going to fly a plane into the Houses of Parliament on a given date, and that perhaps you should invest some money in Boeing or place a bet at Ladbrokes that Big Ben would collapse due to a terrorist event on 21st of December 2012. You could clean up, couldn't you? Or alternatively, if you were told that on the 20th of November 2010, the USA and UK were going to do an Iraq on Iran, and that BAE systems were about to gain their largest order in their history by an order of magnitude, placed by NATO. You'd be sure to buy up a significant number of shares well before the general market ever got a sniff of it, wouldn't you? Anyhow, then we heard Alan Greenspan hypocritically state that the USA is nowhere near a crony capitalist system, while he himself joined Poston and Co. hedge fund and made an absolute killing out of your misery by shorting the subprime mortgage market. Greenspan, having overseen the entire US economy for 18 years, a Bilderberg Group member, and knew precisely what was on the horizon because he set fiscal policy to create the conditions in the first place. So part one clearly demonstrates we are governed by entire entire corruption, while the economic crisis has, has depressed the majority economically, yet the super-rich have, in fact, increased their wealth significantly. This isn't just something we all knew, and well, that's just the way it is. This is in-your-face theft, while the Bilderberg Group are a global network of these super-rich who wish to destroy national sovereignty and you and your family are just collateral damage of absolutely no interest to in them. So our ex-Chancellor of the Exchequer states he wants to be on the level. Well, he's been offered that opportunity by email and he refuses to answer. This is basically what he's saying today. <laughs> Retracting what you said, Alistair? Let, let me remind and translate for you then. I think it's important that government ministers, and particularly me as Chancellor, uh, level with people. And I explain that what is happening to every country in the world now, ours included, is that we have a credit crunch the like of which we haven't seen in generations. You regret blotting out the truth in this frank fashion. I've been saying for many weeks now that we, along with every other country in the world, are facing a unique set of circumstances that credit crunch, high oil and food prices, and why, unlike in the past with other governments, it's necessary for us to support the economy and help people get through this difficult time. Forgive me, but you, you've, you've made that point a number of times. What, what I'm after is, what, what, is the, what was the thinking, what was the thinking behind this? I mean, usually, chances of the Exchequer are, are, are offering uh, gentle, calm reassurance. You're talking about people being pissed off with the economy. You're talking about the worst crisis for 60 years. This is a way of making things, making things worse, perhaps depressing expectations, but certainly making things worse. 
I think it's important that when people ask why are these problems facing countries across the world, that finance ministers explain that we've got a credit crunch, the like of which we have not seen in generations. You've got rising food and oil prices causing inflationary pressures. And we also explain that's why we need to support the economy now and why we will do everything we can to help people and to help the economy through what is undoubtedly a difficult time. Any questions, Alistair? I think you're making it pretty clear that you think it's important that you know you tell people and that you're on the level and that you explain what the problem is. So I have my questions. Answer them. By the way, nice CV, Alistair. Like Brown, like Osborne, like Cameron, like any one of them I could mention. None of you have a public or private limited company background. You, your Chancellor of the Exchequer, so was Brown, and yet you have no background in being a CFO for any company whatsoever. You have no idea about finance, and yet you're the Chief Financial Officer for UK PLC and a Marxist Trotsky is no less. But I'll tell you why we're pissed off, Alistair. Why we're pissed off is because as a collective, you bunch of hopeless individuals in government, in parliament, have silver spoon backgrounds and you have done fuck all in your life. Nothing. That's why we're pissed off. Yet, as a collective, you have the audacity to tell us, or to dictate to us, policy, legislation, laws, when all you have is some flowery academic background, and again, have done fuck all in life, and pay as lip service. You're fucking good at that. Well, let me tell you, Alistair. I've got a physics degree, I've got a business studies degree, and I could run fucking rings around you. I've been 25 years in global sales and business development, and I know more about fucking life than you do. So they appreciate a reply, please. What is it that you're so concerned about by replying to three or four direct and simple questions, Alistair? I'm not your constituent. Always the excuse at the end of the day. The procedural control mechanism and force once more. What if I were to meet you at some form of event and ask these questions? Tell me. When you're interviewed by our media in any form, do you reply, Oh, I'm sorry, I can't answer your questions because you're not a constituent. Apologies for my bluntness, Alistair, but as you can tell, I've no time for fucking sycophants. I think it's important uh, that I tell people in this country that we, along with every other country in the world, face a unique set of circumstances where you've got the credit crunch coming at the same time with high oil and food prices. Every country in the world, huh? But not every person in the world. Okay, folks, it's time for some deconditioning. Imagine for a moment a brand new country being developed, being set up from scratch. It has no money, no infrastructure, nothing. Okay? There's no outside influence, no outside organizations, nothing. There's no IMF, there's no World Bank. But the country decides it wants to build bridges and roads, hospitals, schools, have a police, etc. The whole shebang. And there's no socialism, communism, fascism, Zionism, crapism, dogism, catism, no isms whatsoever because there's absolutely no need for this shit. There's only law, okay? And that law states no harm, injury, or loss. That's all, nothing more, nothing less. And the country has every resource imaginable. It has oil, gas, uranium, it has food, all the agriculture it needs, all the steel, everything. Everything is there. But some arsehole comes along and says, Hey, my ancestors were kings in some far-flung country long, long time ago, and I'm bloodline, therefore I should be king of this new country. 
and therefore I own all the natural resources. What are you going to say? I think piss off comes to mind. However, this could get complex and all I'm trying to do is demonstrate a very simple point. So there's no money and the people want money. They want to create money. So they create a bank to create that money. Question, who owns the bank? Answer, they all do. Anyhow, the point is, why would that bank ever create a credit crunch? Why would it, under what circumstances, would it ever wish to stop printing money? It wouldn't, because it would be in absolutely no one's interest to do so. Yes, I realize this is very simple, but it's you that needs to make it complex. It doesn't need to be complex at all. Now let's look at what Alistair's saying. Alistair's saying that every single country in the world has the same problem as we do. Every single country is in debt. But in our new country, the bank is precisely nationalized. It's owned by the people of the country. So there can be no debt to that bank. That money is generated by the people. So the big anomaly here is as follows. It is the unseen elephant in the living room, so to speak. We're led to believe that every single world nation is in debt, which is true. But there must be two sides, a creditor and a debtor. Yet, if every nation is in debt, then it's obvious there are no creditor nations. We therefore have a single entire planet, planet, in debt. To who? Aliens? Think about it. It's third grade arithmetic. Now we are also led to believe, although we know this is bullshit, for example the Federal Reserve is not a government body, that nations issue their currencies. If they did, then there is no limit to what a country can decide to issue. Yes, I'm aware that such issuance within the existing paradigm leads to currency devaluation against other currencies. Yet the very glaring point here is as follows, against other currencies, which leads to nation by nation imbalance, but overall worldwide balance. Take that point and apply it to the existing circumstances and it applies just as directly. Under this ideology, then when a country is in debt, it must be in debt to another country. But we do not have this scenario, do we? Now throughout the world, with nations issuing their currency, how can it possibly be that every world nation can be in debt, yet there are individuals within these nations who have increased their wealth? That we have every nation who, in essence, create the currency which goes into people's pockets they are in the red while these individuals get richer. The answer is simple. The nations neither control nor own their currencies and it is the very few people who own and control the Bank of England, Federal Reserve, IMF, World Bank, Bank of International Settlements, etc. etc. who create and control the money and decide how and when to inflate the supply or contract it. There is no other explanation, no matter how complex you wish to make things. The world is in debt to these people. How, is that, how has this happened? Well, someone came along and said, my ancestors were, and we fell for it. No, the only nations who are not under this regime are the rogue nations, or what's left of them. This is why Iran, Venezuela, North Korea, etc. are consistently demonized and why Obama and Brown, etc. keep stating they must join the international order.